Late in January 1975, a 17-year-old a German girl called Vera Branders walked out onto the stage of the Cologne Opera House. Now, the Opera House is a, a huge venue, 1,400 seats, but at, at the moment she was on stage, it was empty. It was lit only by the dim green glow of the emergency exit signs. But despite the fact that the place was deserted, she was excited, she was pumped up. It was the, the most thrilling day of her life. Because Vera had managed to set herself up as the youngest concert promoter in Germany. So she, she loved jazz, but there wasn't enough jazz in her home city of Cologne, and so she just started organizing jazz gigs. And very quickly, she'd pulled off this remarkable coup. She persuaded the Cologne Opera House to host a late night concert of improvised jazz by the American musician Keith Jarrett. So in just a, a few hours, Jarrett would walk out onto the stage in front of a sellout crowd. He'd sit down at the piano, and without, without sheet music, without rehearsal, he'd just begin to play, to improvise. So the reason that Branders was on the stage that afternoon was that she was introducing Keith Jarrett to the piano in question. What well, Jarrett immediately looked at the instrument with some suspicion. Walked around it, played a couple of notes, went over to his producer, Manfred Eicher, and muttered together. Vera's starting to get nervous. Manfred Eicher walks over to the piano, plays a couple of notes, walks back, talks some more to Jarrett. And then Manfred Eicher comes over to Vera Brandes and says, if you don't get a new piano, Keith won't play. There'd been a mistake, a mix-up. The Opera House, the clue's in the name, Opera, they're not into jazz anyway. They've been told that this American wanted a Bosendorfer piano, so the piano crews had found a Bosendorfer and they put it on the stage. Um, but it was the wrong instrument. It was, it was a rehearsal model. It was beaten up. It was, um, the, the keys were sticking, the pedals didn't work. The, upper register sounded tinny because all of the, the felt had worn away. It was a really harsh sound. And most importantly of all, it wasn't actually big enough. It wasn't a full-sized concert grand piano. Vera later said it was a tiny piano. It was like half a piano. And that's why uh, Jarrett immediately, immediately could see the instrument wasn't fit for purpose. It was unplayable. And of course, he didn't want to play it. So he left. So now Vera Brandes has to get a replacement piano, but here's the problem. Okay? It's the 1970s, it's Germany, and it's Friday afternoon. Everyone's gone home. There's no way she's going to get a new piano. She makes some calls, she tries, I mean, she, she tries really hard, but it quickly becomes apparent there is no way to get the right instrument onto the stage in time for this late night concert. And so she calls up a piano tuner who comes and he, he does his best. But really, there's only one thing that Vera Brandes can do. She walks out of the opera house. It's raining outside, raining hard. She sees Keith Jarrett sitting there in his car. She taps on the window. He winds it down. It's the 1970s. <laughs> and he looks at her. She looks at him. And she begs him to play. Begs him. And Keith Jarrett looks at this bedraggled, rain-drenched German teenager. He thinks of the 1,400 people who are going to come to this sell-out concert. He thinks of what they're going to do to her when he doesn't play. And he takes pity on her. He says, never forget only for you. And so, that night, in front of 1,400 people,
Keith Jarrett walks out onto the stage. He sits down at the piano he knows is unplayable, and he begins. moments it becomes clear that something magical is happening. So Jarrett is avoiding these harsh tinny notes. He's sticking to the middle of the keyboard. And that gives the music this very soothing ambient quality. But it's a midnight concert, so he's going to send everybody to sleep if he, if he just does that, pleasant as it is. So the other thing he has to do is to set up these rolling, repetitive riffs. He's trying to get some resonance. Remember, he's trying to reach the back of the auditorium with this tiny little piano. So get the, get the bass going, get the resonance going. And the other thing he does is to stand up at the keyboard. You can hear on the recording of this, you can hear him moaning. And he's pounding down on the keys, desperately trying to get enough volume, enough intensity to reach the people at the back of the hall. So there's this real tension between the, the soothing notes that he's playing and the violence with which he's playing them. It's electrifying. It's a masterpiece. The audience loved it. And audiences continue to love it because, yes, it was recorded. Keith Jarrett and Manfred Eicher recorded the concert, not because they thought they'd get anything out of it, but because they wanted a documentary record of what a musical catastrophe sounds like. <laughs> but, of course, they didn't get a catastrophe. They got a masterpiece. And they got the Cone Concert Album, which is the best-selling jazz piano album in history. I love this music. Two of my children were born while we were listening to this music. I mean, I have to say, my wife is now a little... She has mixed feelings about the whole thing, but I, <laughs> I still like it. But the reason I've become fascinated by the Cone Concert is two things. One, I think that what happened that night isn't a fluke. But yes, it was special, because Keith Jarrett is a special musician. But this sort of thing, maybe at a lower level, happens all the time. People face difficult circumstances, they face obstacles, tools that are breaking in their hands, colleagues who are awkward, deadlines that seem impossible to meet, things that just don't work as they should. And they rise to the challenge, they more than rise to the challenge, and they produce their best work. It happens a lot. And the second thing that interests me is the psychology of this, and in particular, Keith Jarrett's reaction. He's a brave, creative musician. Remember, he's improvising every night. And yet, when Keith Jarrett was faced with the unplayable piano, he didn't think to himself, oh, this is an unparalleled opportunity to seek fresh musical inspiration. He thought to himself, it's a crap piano, it's going to be a crap concert, I don't want any part of it. And thank goodness he changed his mind. I think all of us, in remotely analogous situations, tend to have the same feeling. We're only human, right? I don't want to have to work under these conditions. And so we resist. So I want to talk about those two things. Why does this happen? And why do we resist? And how can we overcome that resistance? So why does it happen? Well, there are two things going on, really. One of them is psychological, but one of them, I think, is, is really it's almost built into the structure of problems themselves. So you might think when you, you, know, you hear um, about Keith Jarrett producing this, this amazing performance, well, that's only for geniuses. Well, let me talk about a really straightforward everyday example. Can I just check who here uh, arrived on the tube? Who came here on the tube? Excellent. I came on a bike myself, but, you know, I like the tube too. I too am a Londoner. Now, you know when you travel on the tube, those of you who commute regularly, you get pretty good at it, right? You really, you know, you know that you, could, you stand here on the platform rather than here on the platform. You'll be right there in the right position to get straight on the, the carriage and the carriage that you want. So, I mean, obviously, if you're going, for example, to London Bridge on the Jubilee Line, you want to be at the back of the train, so when you get off at London Bridge, you'll be at the Borough Market entrance, and you'll be at the front of the queue for Cappuccino at the Monmouth Coffee House. You know these things. 
And I swore when I moved to London I would never become that person, but I did become that person. We all become that person. So you'd think that commuters really have, have got their route to work planned perfectly. Okay, but my thesis is, if you disrupt that route to work, you potentially get a better commute. Well, how could we test such an outrageous suggestion? You know, you're going to A, B test your way to work? Well, fortunately, there are some um, very kind, public-spirited people who work for the trade unions who will happily, just from time to time, just to see what happens, shut down the London Underground. So this happened about three years ago, and um, uh, a couple of economists, actually three economists, got hold of the data that were generated when there was this tube strike. So the tube strike in question um, shut down two-thirds of London Underground stations. This was at a time, it was kind of before contactless really came in, so everybody's using the Oyster card. And the Oyster card works on all of these underground stations. It also works on the overground station, and it also works on the buses. So if you've got the, the data from the Oyster card network, you can see what everyone's doing. And what these three economists did when they got hold of the data, suitably anonymized, they were able to identify, well, person number you know, 8264370, that person takes the same route to work every single day and takes the same route home again every single night, and we'll call this person a regular commuter. So you identify this set of regular commuters, and then you say, okay, what happens when the tube strike comes along? Well, the answer is many of them change their route, of course. Now, here's the question. What happens 48 hours later when the tube strike finishes? And the answer is tens of thousands of people never go back. They have discovered, courtesy of a 48-hour strike, that they have been doing commuting wrong their entire lives. <laughs> and all they needed was this shock. Now, it turns out this is not a particularly uh, new insight. People who do mathematical optimization so deal with problems like scheduling problems. How do you route an Amazon delivery van to, to deliver 200 parcels? Or um, how do you pack uh, components onto a, a silicon chip, an integrated circuit? These sorts of problems, it turns out um, it's impossible to solve them uh, completely. They're just too big, they're too complex. But you can approximate your way towards a solution. You can hunt for a solution in a sort of systematic way. And so how, do, how does the hunt for this sort of solution work? Well, you might naturally think that the hunt for a solution is a kind of A-B test. Okay, you just keep running these little tests and you try and figure out, you, you, you optimize. What's the, what's the best way? So test this against this, test this against this, test this against this, this route against that route, this layout against that layout, and eventually we'll get to some kind of solution. That, it turns out, doesn't work terribly well. There's not that there's anything wrong with a step-by-step -step incremental approach. It's just it's, it's incomplete. Because what happens is you get stuck at a local optimum. So you find the best of all of the alternatives that are quite similar. But there's some other alternative, something radically different, that you never try. You never get there through a process of marginal improvements. You never get there through a process of A-B testing. It's just too different. And so algorithms that try to solve these sorts of puzzles, they all contain a healthy dose of randomness, like serious randomness. Not coin flips between two nearly identical shades of blue, but just throw all the pieces in the air and start again from scratch, that kind of randomness. And what you find when you, you use that sort of problem solving is the randomness, the disruption, this kind of embracing of the unquantifiable, the unmeasurable, it actually complements the step-by-step -step incremental approach. You need both. Yeah? The step-by-step -step approach can take you from the bottom of Mount Everest to the top of Mount Everest, but it's the random approach that gets you to Mount Everest in the first place rather than the, the, your nearest pitcher's mound. So this is partly the, the basic structure of the problem. You know, this, these random shocks help us solve problems. They get us out of our comfort zone, and they get us exploring totally new ways of doing things that we could, in principle, have tried all along, but perhaps we haven't 
ever thought to. So that's the, the kind of the complexity, the mathematical part of the equation. But there is something else going on that I referred to. There's a psychological component too. Let me give you a little example of what I mean. So there's a, this is one of my favorite studies. It's a very, very silly study in some ways. Conducted by a team of psychologists led by a guy called Daniel Oppenheimer. And um, Oppenheimer and his team um, got together with um, a group of high school teachers and they ran a randomized trial. So these high school teachers, half their students were getting uh, regular handouts formatted in something like Arial or Helvetica or Times New Roman, a really straightforward font. The other half of their students, chosen at random, were getting the exact same materials at the exact same time, but in, with different fonts. They would choose fonts such as monotype Corsiva, which is designed to look like joined up writing, or perhaps that sort of dense Germanic punch of Hattenschweiler, which is a beautiful kind of font, but you wouldn't want to read an 800-page novel in it. Or, you can see this one coming, right? Yes, Comic Sans. Well, actually, <laughs> Comic Sans italicized. <laughs> that extra zesty bounce. Um, now, you would think, right? You would think, well, uh, maybe it doesn't make any difference. I mean, they're the same handouts. Maybe it doesn't matter what font they're written in. Um, although probably a lot of people in this room have, have run A-B tests with fonts and they think it probably does matter. Um, but to the extent that it matters, you would surely think, well, I mean, that, a font like this is going to work better than a font like this or a font like this. These fonts are hard to read. But that is, of course, not what Daniel Oppenheimer's team found. They found that, and this is not a, a one-off uh, trial, this is over six months. They found that over six months, the students who were getting... The, uh, their handouts in Arial or Times New Roman started to systematically underperform the students who were getting their handouts in Hattenschweiler, Monotype Corsiva, or Comic Sans Italicized. So what is going on? Because there is no way that Comic Sans Italicized deserves to be an adornment to our education system. Well, what we think is going on is simply this. When you get a handout in Times New Roman, it's like every handout you've ever seen. It just looks the same. It doesn't really grab your attention. But when it's written in Hattenschweiler, you think, what on earth is this? I mean, it's not, it's not impossible to read. It's not like it's formatted in, in wingdings. <laughs> but, but it's a little difficult to read. It's just hard enough that it captures your attention. It slows you down. Maybe it makes you work a little bit harder to figure out what a word is, maybe thinking about the context, and that's enough to improve student performance. So this attention-grabbing uh, part of the, of the picture, the, these, these difficult situations, these obstacles, I think is a very important part of the psychology of what's going on here. You can bet that Keith Jarrett was paying attention, close attention, to that piano and the challenges that it was giving him. Now, one of my favorite examples of this concerns other people. Because, of course, if we're talking about obstacles and problems, what we're really talking about is our colleagues, right? Our colleagues, our clients. Our, I mean, other people are, are the source of all of life's problems, aren't they? The source of and sometimes the solution, too. Um, and I speak as an economist. I speak as someone who's much more comfortable talking to numbers than talking to people. Um, but there's a, a wonderful little study of this, too. I mean, lots and lots of studies showing that teams of diverse people, teams of people you don't necessarily understand, who have different nationality, different gender, different age, different professional qualifications, those teams tend to outperform homogenous teams, which sort of makes sense because those teams are able to, for all the potential difficulties and communication problems, those teams have a larger number of cognitive tools and perspectives that they can draw on. And we know this, and of course we instinctively ignore it. But the study I really like was conducted by three psychologists, led by uh, Catherine Phillips of Northwestern University. And what she studied was not so much the diversity, but just the sheer awkwardness of working in the wrong team. She gave uh, the people who were working on uh, in this um, study, she gave them murder mystery problems to solve. 
So there's a dossier of information, someone's been killed, here are photos of the crime scene, witness statements, alibis, everything. And it's multiple choice. There are three possible suspects. So you read through the dossier and you try and figure out who did it. You've got 20 minutes. And the success rate for an individual working on these problems is just under 50% which is not great, because if you think about it as multiple choice, success rate of chimps is 33%. So, anyway, I mean, they're they're, so people are better than chimps, that's good. I mean, it's, which is not true for economic forecasting, for a start. When she gave the same task to a group of four uh, friends, so these are people who knew each other, they're all in the same college fraternity or college sorority. So she, she gives the same task to this group of four people who know each other and gives them 20 minutes, and they do better. The success rate goes from just under 50% to just over 50%, which is not that encouraging given you just quadrupled uh, the resource that you put into the problem. So that's one half of the randomized trial, four friends working on the problem. The other half of the randomized trial, three friends, and for maximum awkwardness, one stranger. So three people who all know each other, they're all from the same college fraternity, and then Mr. Gooseberry joins them for 20 minutes. And they work together on the problem. And this additional person doesn't have any extra information, any valuable perspectives, not meaningfully diverse. They're just awkward, just different and difficult. And at the end of the 20 minutes, the success rate has gone from, remember, just under 50%, so just over 50% for the four friends to 75% for the three friends and the stranger. It's a huge leap in performance. What really interests me is what happens when Catherine Phillips asked people about their experiences. And the people who worked with their friends said they had a great time, and not only that, they were sure they'd got their man. Whereas the people who worked with the stranger, not only did they not enjoy themselves, they also didn't think they'd solved the problem. So this is important because you've got a group of people who systematically, and I don't mean this personally, you guys on this half of the room, but systematically underperforming and at the same time think they're great. And this other group of peop people who are systematically overperforming, full of doubt, because the stranger, the extra person, is making them feel awkward. So we're actively avoiding that very thing that could potentially improve our performance. In the same way that we don't look for randomness and we don't look for awkward fonts and we don't look for unplayable pianos and we don't long for tube strikes to help us better explore our commute. We never embrace this stuff, but we should try. That means I want to give you one final example. So when I was working on, on a book about this subject, it's called Messy, um, I interviewed Brian Eno. It's very exciting for me, and about half of you are now going, wow, Brian Eno, and the other half of you are going, who's Brian Eno? <laughs> so Brian Eno is a, is a composer and a producer uh, who basically invented ambient music, created Prince's favorite album, Another Green World, worked with Phil Collins, uh, was in Roxy Music, um, produced the choreographer Twyla Tharp, uh, Milos Forman, the director of Amadeus, oh, and a few, a few pop bands he worked with, um, Coldplay, U2, David Bowie, just a few guys. And um, the reason that these people want Brian Eno in their studio is because he's very, he's thought a lot about this. He is the unplayable piano. He is the awkward stranger. Right? He's the ugly font. It is his job to get them out of their comfort zone to make them think of things that they weren't thinking of, to make them try approaches they were afraid to try. And one of the things that he specialised in was the use of this rather strange deck of cards. He used to pull out when he was working on uh, David Bowie's albums in Berlin. They're called the Oblique Strategies. So he'd pull out a card and they're full of these weird gnomic instructions. You just choose one and you have to deal with it. So uh, make a sudden, destructive, unpredictable action incorporate, remove specifics, convert to ambiguities. Something for anyone interested in measurements to ponder. Oh, one of my favorite ones, change instrument roles. Yeah, brilliant. You've got the world's greatest guitarist in the studio and the world's greatest drummer. 
but sadly, the guitarist is on the drums and the drummer's on the guitar. <laughs> he would do these crazy things. And the thing is, musicians, they hated it. They hated it. They thought it sounded terrible. They thought the experiments were stupid. Carlos Alomar, great guitarist, said it's like being slapped in the face. No one wanted to work like this. It was only later, sometimes years later, that everyone acknowledged, actually, they were amazing albums. Carlos Alomar, much later, said, yeah, those cards, they took me to a different place. To be honest, I didn't like the place. But then when I came back, I was fresh. So maybe there is something to them after all. And Carlos Alomar, these days, teaches guitar, and he makes his students use the oblique strategies. He says, I need them to feel what I felt. That pressure, the disruption, searching for some kind of solution. And that's why I find them so interesting, because Eno thought hard not only about the value of disruption, not only about the value of getting out of your comfort zone, of trying to reckon with things that we can't measure and can't predict, but he also thought about the process of resistance to that and how to overcome it. And however it is, maybe it's sheer willpower, maybe it's the flip of a weird card, or, or maybe it's a guilt trip from a German teenager. But however we do it, we need to find a way from time to time to sit down and to play the unplayable piano. It's been great to talk to you. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you.